Welcome to the AI for You Cafe. Today, we have a special cafe on the Legato project with four speakers, which is really special. And I'm very happy. And I'm sorry, now even I get a call. No. Sorry for the interruption. You see, the cafe is now perfect. And <laughs> so, one moment. I welcome to today uh, is Osman Unsal from Barcelona Supercomputer Center. Hi, Osman. Hi. So, and our special guest, last moment special guest coming, Pira Noor so, Somro from Chalmers University, right here, here. and Nils Kuxa from Bielefeld University. Hello. And hopefully soon, Hans Salomonsen, and he will come later into our cafe. The title of today is Energy Efficient AI a perspective from the Legato project. My name is Carmen McWilliams and I'm the moderator and organizer of the cafe and I'm partner in the European AI project. So just again to repeat fast the little rules here, the session will be recorded. No confidential information shall be shared in this cafe session. In this cafe, the speakers express their personal view and opinions that is not necessarily the official AI project opinion. So what are we doing here? This is an online cafe and we share insights into the European AI scene. Participants get the chance to share knowledge and experiences and meet stakeholders from various areas of AI research and application. And it's interactive. You have the chance as participants to write your questions on the right side in the control panel. There's a chat question menu and you can write them in and after the presentations i will read them to the speakers so great you're all there all the participants out there and thank you that all the speakers are here and we start with our program to the first speaker will be osman unsal and i shortly introduce osman and also i will introduce Pira, because they're together making the first presentation. Osman co-leads the Computer Architecture for Parallel Paradigms Research Group at Barcelona Supercomputing Center. His main research interests are in computer architecture, fault tolerance, energy efficiency, and transactional memory. He will introduce the Legato project and give an overview of the energy saving theme of the project. And with him is Pira Noor Somro from Chalmers University. So now I give the moderator role to Osman and afterwards to Pira and welcome once more in this cafe. So Osman has now the moderator role. He can now take over. Thank you very much, uh, Carmen. Uh, can you see my screen? Everything is perfect. Okay. We got Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as uh, uh, Carmen mentioned, uh, I want to um, have this change my screen. Um, just a second. Yes. Uh, so um, uh, we are going to uh, look at uh, the uh, use of uh, AI in the uh, Legato uh, Low Energy Heterogeneous uh, Computing uh, Project. Uh, I'm the coordinator. My name is Osman Unso. Uh, and uh, the reason uh, for, for the project, uh, which is an H2020 project, uh, is that the challenge uh, that uh, we have in, in computing uh, is uh, not uh, floating uh, point operations per second, but in uh, megawatts uh, now. Uh, so we started from this uh, point. The main focus of the project is energy efficiency uh, with a data center uh, and uh, edge uh, focus uh, uh, specifically. Okay. 
And uh, how did we get uh, here? Uh, Moore's law, uh, as we know, is, is slowing down. Uh, so um, that we cannot uh, fit uh, uh, 2x uh, number of transistors uh, anymore uh, across uh, uh, generations. So this uh, necessitated a move towards uh, accelerators, a special uh, purpose uh, uh, functional uh, units that uh, we can fit uh, in the available area. Uh, it gives a better utilization, let's say, uh, for the limited uh, transistor budget that we have, more energy efficient, uh, and uh, therefore move into heterogeneous computing. Uh, to explore new architectures and models of computation uh, is uh, what it brings uh, together with this uh, heterogeneity. Um, so the model of uh, computation is key. Accelerators are important. GPUs have been used, especially, I, I would say, uh, for the uh, neural network, uh, let's say, segment of the AI, uh, uh, AI area. Um, they are doing a very good job uh, training and inference on the inference. They have this uh, 16 uh, uh, bits uh, floating point units. FPGAs are also interesting. Uh, so it, they, they have been like a latecomer uh, to, the, to, the, to the show, let's say, of, of uh, these accelerators for, for neural networks, for AI. Um, but their uh, advantage compared to GPU is their uh, um, reconfigurability on one side, and they can they can also shrink the number of bits that they can operate with. Uh, that's really good uh, for uh, the inference side. So, and we can build ultra deep, high efficient pipelines using FPGAs. Uh, the ambition uh, of uh, uh, Legato is to uh, create software stack support for energy efficient heterogeneous computing. Uh, we start uh, uh, by uh, uh, our partner developed uh, efficient heterogeneous hardware substrate with CPU, GPU, and FPGA, as well as FPGA-based data flow engines uh, all together in the same chassis. Uh, and we put on top of that, uh, and we develop a made in Europe a mature software stack for energy efficiency. So uh, together, um, Together with this uh, goal of energy efficiency, uh, we strive for one order of magnitude in energy efficiency. We also have uh, side, uh, let's say, uh, side goals of uh, keeping energy efficiency in mind uh, to, to be fault tolerant, uh, to be, uh, uh, mm, uh, to be uh, uh, productive uh, here, and, and as, as well as uh, to be secure. So those are also uh, goals of the project as well. When we look at it, at the center is we have uh, our uh, software energy efficient uh, uh, tool set uh, together with uh, fault tolerance, security, and productivity goals, in addition to energy efficiency, running on hardware, uh, third hardware platforms, and with some uh, use cases that I'm, I'm going to come shortly. Um, so we have uh, 10 partners. Uh, I'm from Barcelona Supercomputing Center. In today's talk, we will have uh, partners uh, uh, representing Schalmers, Bielefeld, and Embedded uh, in the other uh, talks. So you can have an idea of the various kind of things that we are doing in the project. Um, we, we cover four use, uh, use cases, uh, some of uh, which are really relevant uh, for AI. The first one is healthcare. When we started the project uh, three years ago, uh, we, uh, we took uh, uh, the specific uh, uh, sub uh, uh, subtopic of healthcare uh, infection biomarkers, a lot of statistical processing, very heavy uh, computational uh, workloads uh, being uh, used, and, and the idea is to uh, 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 to indicate the presence, absence, or uh, severity of a, a specific disease. So need, no need to say that this has become even more relevant and, and urgent uh, in the times that we are. Uh, living right now. The second uh, uh, use case is the smart home, uh, specifically an assisted living use case, uh, so that we can, uh, uh, there the objective and the relationship to AI is to learn from the user's behavior and anticipate future behavior. Uh, so this is also one of the use cases that we have in the project. Uh, we have a smart city use case. Uh, we have like a weather report except for pollutant data. It's like a weather prediction city by city. Um, we have a 3D map of Barcelona, and we, we, we do this work in the supercomputer that we have in Barcelona. 
We have a machine learning use case, uh, automated driving and graphics uh, rendering, uh, very direct related use case, uh, and uh, uh, more on that uh, will come a little bit later. And we have a secure IoT gateway, uh, putting energy efficiency and security together. So when we uh, when we look at the AI uh, uh, techniques or the uh, the AI use cases that we have in the project, I, I would like to start with the healthcare use case. Uh, so for the biomarker uh, research, uh, we are uh, leveraging uh, tree-based uh, uh, methods and lasso regression. Uh, we have integrated uh, uh, these uh, integration uh, into the, uh, the SCON security technology that we have in the project, uh, which uh, uh, helps efficient deployment of Intel SGX uh, hardware security extensions. And uh, we have uh, also scheduling techniques to help uh, accelerate one of the key algorithms uh, in the uh, biomarker uh, research using random facts. Uh, we will uh, I will not uh, uh, dwell or detail uh, very much in, in, uh, in this aspect uh, in, in this talk, uh, but if you're interested, I can put you in contact uh, with our uh, partners, Helmholtz Center for Infection Disease Research. Uh, they are the ones that are doing this work. In the second uh, uh, use case, we have the smart home uh, use case that I just mentioned. Uh, we will talk about the uh, you know use of AI there. Um, so it will uh, uh, it will be later presentation uh, by my colleague uh, Niels uh, from Bielefeld. Um, and uh, the last talk uh, today uh, will be the uh, machine learning uh, use case uh, with the details of uh, what we have done uh, in the project as well as. Uh, what Embedo is doing in general, uh, Hans uh, Solomonson will, uh, will talk about this. Um, and uh, last but not least, immediately following my uh, talk, uh, uh, Pira uh, from uh, Schalmers uh, will give a student research uh, perspective, a quick one on AI, on the topic of uh, scheduling the uh, VGG application across heterogeneous uh, cores in mobile edge devices, specifically the uh, NVIDIA Jetson, uh, which is composed of a heterogeneous core of uh, 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 four cores of uh, ARM and the two, two core of uh, uh, specifically uh, NVIDIA developed uh, Denver 2. Uh, so this will immediately follow my talk. Uh, and I would like to uh, give a brief uh, overview very quick of the undervolting technology uh, that we, are, uh, we have developed uh, for neural network. Uh, this has been just uh, selected as in a Tetramax technology transfer grant from uh, university, in this case us, uh, to industry and in this case uh, uh, Embedal. And uh, so I will talk about the details of this technology. The work has been done as part of the PhD uh, thesis of uh, uh, my colleague Besat at BSc. Uh, the motivation uh, is that we uh, power consumption of neural networks is, is a major issue. We have uh, GPUs, FPGAs, and ASICs um, that uh, that are uh, that are for uh, used for uh, acceleration of uh, neural networks. Uh, however, FPGAs are still uh, 10x less uh, power efficient than ASICs. So ASICs, such as for example the uh, Google TPU, uh, the Havana chips uh, from Intel, uh, the Graph Core uh, Colossus IPU, and I think some Banova's uh, reconfigurable data flow unit. They're all existing ASICs, uh, mm, mm, all products, and uh, uh, they, they are, uh, we, we want to be with FPGAs as flexible, more flexible than the ASICs, which are not flexible. We want to be more flexible, but with a similar uh, power efficiency. How do we do it? Uh, we go below the safe uh, voltage. We turn down the voltage uh, below the safe uh, voltage level uh, and we, we can get a very significant uh, performance uh, uh, power uh, efficiency uh, gain uh, doing so. Uh, we did this uh, study on five image classification workloads uh, with three different uh, FPGA boards uh, from uh, Xilinx. And uh, if I briefly uh, revisit uh, uh, that we are, uh, uh, the, the neural networks, they're uh, uh, advantage is their inherent resilience to errors. So they can they can uh, withstand a certain number of uh, bit flips uh, here and there. Uh, advantage of FPGAs, uh, higher throughput than GPUs and better flexibility than ASICs. 
underwater reduces power, but then could have some reliability uh, issues uh, uh, because uh, then with the lower voltage, uh, things might not uh, finish uh, in time and we might get some bit flips. So uh, our goal is uh, to bridge the power efficiency gap um, and uh, uh, and while at the same time we, we study the, uh, the behavior of uh, FPGAs in this, uh, uh, this undervolting, uh, going below the safe water situation uh, for neural networks, and uh, we want to study the effect of environmental temperature. So uh, we looked at uh, five uh, uh, CNN image uh, classification uh, workloads uh, seen here. Uh, we use uh, Xilinx with uh, platform uh, to map CNN into uh, FPGAs. We use three uh, Xilinx uh, uh, different boards. And then we, uh, uh, by using the voltage rails on the FPGAs, uh, we turn the uh, voltage uh, uh, below the safe uh, limit uh, to where uh, uh, below the safe uh, uh, nominal voltage of uh, 850 to around uh, 550. Uh, there is a large, very large guard band where we don't see any errors at all. Uh, so this is a very uh, good region uh, that uh, usually the, uh, the uh, nominal voltage is set much higher than uh, necessary uh, and we can save uh, very significantly by going below that. Then we get into a critical region, a narrow region where we see errors and then, uh, then at the point where we cannot operate anymore. When we look at the results, we see that there's a huge band here uh, where we, we significantly uh, increase uh, the uh, energy efficiency uh, by more than 2.5x uh, without any faults. And then we start to get uh, uh, into a region where the uh, neural network uh, accuracy starts getting uh, a hit uh, because of these uh, errors starting to happen. Here you can see for the five different benchmarks that uh, the, uh, 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 this is the uh, actually the inference uh, uh, accuracy um, and we can see that it takes a hit. Uh, however, uh, before it takes a hit, as you can see, there's a huge uh, band that we can exploit. Uh, we can have a very large uh, energy efficiency without any uh, uh, detriment to the neural network uh, uh, inference accuracy. Then uh, one interesting thing is that uh, when we look at the temperature, um, somewhat uh, surprisingly, uh, with uh, higher uh, temperatures, uh, you see the very interesting behavior here. This is the accuracy. At 50 uh, uh, degrees, you have very high accuracy compared to, uh, let's say, uh, a, uh, a relatively low uh, temperature of uh, 34. Uh, the warmer you keep your FPGA boards, the happier they are uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the inference accuracy when you are uh, undervolted. So this was an interesting, uh, let's say, uh, finding that we think uh, could, be, um, could be applied uh, maybe in the future uh, in, the, in the data centers. Maybe you don't need to be so aggressive with the, with the, with the cooling that way. So I think uh, this is it for me. I'm, I'm a little bit... Uh, Behind, uh, with that, I would like to uh, leave the floor to Pira, who will who will do uh, a short uh, example of very fresh results that uh, she she's getting. Um, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. You're completely on time. <laughs> uh, very interesting. I keep now introducing the next speaker, and the next will be Pira. So I give you now the moderator role. As I said before, Pira Noor Somo is from Chalmers University. Pira, do you have it? I put you also on camera. It's me who put you out, so don't worry. I will now make you also seeable. It's not you, it's me. And Pira is coming. Yes, perfect. Yes, I think my screen is also visible now. Yes. Everything is perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. So, uh, hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about my work on scheduling VGG across heterogeneous cores and mobile edge devices. So, basically, VGG is a convolutional neural network. And the nature of this uh, use case is to process stream of data, uh, input data, uh, or more specifically, video 
frames. So I'm basically working on the scheduling of VGG in a parallel in a pipeline parallel fashion on heterogeneous cores. <clears throat> Uh, so um, my framework has actually two modules, uh, uh, an offline module and an uh, and a online module. So basically, in online mod, in offline module, I first uh, extract the description of the neural network layers uh, from the, uh, from the structure of neural network uh, by using a simple template tensor language. And uh, uh, after extracting the description of uh, the network, I uh, calculate the basic pipeline uh, configuration for a neural network on, uh, on a heterogeneous device. And after uh, this offline um, uh, procedure, uh, uh, I launch the convolutional neural network on the device. Uh, along with the inputs frames. So uh, in the online module, we basically first um, first try some pipeline configurations and pick the one which proves to be the most throughput maximizing pipeline configuration for a given uh, for a given platform. So uh, in the next slide, I'm going to show you uh, the whole uh, procedure of training and then running a pipeline stage. Um, so uh, let's move to the second slide. OK. Yeah, so um, here you can see that um, the, the, there is a phase of training on the system. So basically, the system is again NVIDIA Jetson TX2, which was uh, mentioned by Osman. It has two Denver cores and uh, four ARM A57 cores. So um, in the training phase, basically, my algorithm tries some pipeline configurations, uh, uh, some uh, pipeline stages of uh, two or, or pipeline configuration that can contains three stages, four, or maximum up to six pipeline stages. And after the training phase, the, when the algorithm converges, uh, you can see a vertical red line on the uh, in the figure. That vertical red line shows the end of the training phase. And by the end, we get a configuration of pipeline, which proves to be or is expected to be the near optimal pipeline configuration for, uh, for VGG on TX2. And then after training, a normal pipeline stage uh, uh, phase starts and the remaining uh, input frames execute in a pipeline fashion. So we can see in this figure that after the training phase ends, we have achieved a pipeline stage which has a, a very negligible uh, length of bubble uh, or bottlenecks and uh, uh, the throughput is maximized as much as possible. Uh, the best configuration in this training was found to be a three pipeline stage uh, and uh, with, the dis uh, with the distribution of layers uh, such as so since VGG 16 has actually 21 layers and 16 out of uh, 21 are compute intensive layers. So the breakdown is such that that the six uh, first six stages are packed into pipeline stage one. Uh, next five stages are packed into pipeline stage two. And then other 10 stages are packed into pipeline stage three. Uh, with this, uh, since um, at this point, I had an idea that, okay, algorithm is doing something better and it is uh, converging to a result which is uh, which seems to be better. But in order to compare it to, with some baseline uh, and uh, to make a um, uh, sort of a, uh, analysis that how much efficient this scheduling algorithm is basically it's not a scheduling algorithm it's a search space optimization which i am doing on the top of uh, uh, the scheduler so in the next slide i'm going to show uh, some comparison between the uh, between the brute force algorithm and the pipe search algorithm which i have used for the training so since we know that brute force algorithm is is a, is a case where every possible uh, uh, search point is uh, tried and tested so um, uh, to make this is uh, to make this uh, analysis uh, uh, in a real time i uh, made a small search space of uh, four cores instead of six so i again used nvidia but this time only two denver cores and two a57 cores 
and uh, the application is VGG 16 uh, again and uh, I used uh, 2000 input frames to test the uh, the comparison so uh, in this table actually that the exhaustive search or the brute force algorithm took uh, 1970 different trials uh, to test which pipeline stage could be the better uh, one and um, it took almost 81,000, uh, um, yeah, 8,100 seconds. Uh, as compared to the pipe search algorithm, which converged within 41 trials, and uh, uh, the overall training time of uh, the algorithm was uh, 116 seconds, and the execution of 2,000 frames ended in uh, 2,900, approximately 3,000 seconds. The good thing uh, which I observed in this experiment is that after trying all the configurations, the best configuration turned out from exhaustive search or the brute force search was the same as the one which was uh, which is uh, explored by, by the pipe search algorithm. So um, what it is, the, the configuration is basically this sequence tells that uh, uh, there would, uh, it is better to have a pipeline stage of uh, three pipe, uh, pipeline of three stages. And uh, uh, the first stage should get seven layers, first seven layers, followed by four layers in the second stage, and the last 10 layers in the third stage. Since uh, I, now I have um, four cores, but the pipeline we have three pipeline stages. So first pipeline stage gets two cores, and the other uh, have only one uh, A57s. So the point here is that um, since the the cores are heterogeneous, and we initially when we are when we start the search, we don't know that which core is faster or slow. Uh, the algorithm doesn't know. That's why we we run some uh, uh, configuration so that we can find a better one. And the seed which I compute from the offline uh, or the pre-processing module is quite similar to what is explored. So if you see, there is a difference only in uh, the distribution of seven, four, ten. But the initially, which I suggested uh, uh, in the offline module, is six five ten. So uh, this actually uh, gives um, a conclusion that uh, utilizing the seeds based on a network descriptors can help us to reduce the uh, search space, and we can actually make a comparison online. Uh, so with that, I end my talk, and thank you very much. So thank you, Pira. Thank you very much to give us such a deep insight. And as the time is moving on, I'm now taking back the moderator role. So you cannot show anymore your presentation. And I will now introduce Nils Kuxa. I hope I say the name right. Hi, Nils. Hi. Hi. Good, you're there. And I will introduce you. Nils Kuxa studied computer science. I will now turn you also on. Studied computer science at Bielefeld University with a focus on the field of physics. He received his bachelor in 2013 and his master's degree in 2016 at Bielefeld University with a semester abroad at the Queensland University of Technology. He is now working in the research group Cognitronics and Sensor Systems, Center of Excellence, Cognitive Interaction Technology at Bielefeld University as a research associate since 2017. And he will introduce now to us the topic of smart home and AI by presenting an interconnected research apartment, integrating smart technologies in different ways, for example, smart mirror, smart kitchen or smart door. So now I'll let Niels talk. I will also now, I see that we don't see you yet. Let me just try to get you back. So I put you back. The camera, maybe it works. Yes. Yeah. So it's up to you now, the show. Hi. Yes, uh, as already mentioned, I'm Niels and I will now talk a little bit, or a little bit about uh, our smart home uh, use case we had in Legato. So um, it's more about AI at the edge. Um, and as already mentioned, um, before Legato, we all, were also or already um, involved to some smart home environments somewhere within our facility, like the one on the left, um, where we have different um, kinds of sensors integrated into to one of our offices. 
and uh, measuring stuff and so on. Some are um, without our facility in cooperation with the different um, companies, for example, Beta, which is a, a huge uh, hospital and, and care facility company here in, in Germany. I don't know if anybody knows it or not. Doesn't really matter. Um, and another one is um, with Miele. Um, and they all have somehow some similar um, fields or areas which they are focusing on. And some are more specialized on, on, on one part of uh, a smart home. Like the Miele one is more focused on the, uh, on the kitchen and so on. So usually what we always do in, in our smart home uh, environments are, are some typical use cases we all, all, uh, always tackle. Um, which I just um, briefly mentioned here, like uh, an intelligent door, which uh, recognizes the user uh, and opens uh, automatically. And it's also um, recognizing obstacles. Uh, the door should not open, like a bag, which is in front of the door, or um, a finger within the door, that it should not close. Um, some kind of, of a dialogue uh, assistance, like a virtual AI, which helps uh, you with different kinds of um, the everyday life, like uh, organizing your, your calendar, stuff like this. Um, the kitchen I already mentioned with Miele, where you have um, basically uh, um, an assistant, which helps you or guides you through, through cooking um, and tells you where everything is within the, in the, in the um, facility and so on. And we have a, a fitness chair where you can just ba do basic training uh, things. And um, last but not least, the, the magic mirror or the smart mirror um, to inter uh, interact with the whole flat. Um, and what you already can, can, can um, uh, see is that we uh, have some similarities between all of those uh, things. They are always using some, some sort of, of control interface like gesture or speech and you always want to know uh, who's in front of it so we always uh, uh, most often have a, a face recognition also built in and um, what we always uh, focusing on are is um, energy efficient uh, sorry not energy efficiency but uh, data security so uh, in the past, we always used beefy hardware to tackle all problems. Like the kitchen has one uh, 1080 integrated into it to do all the neural networks or the smart mirror has two uh, graphics cards in, in, inside of it. So every room in this apartment is, is taking up about 600 watt. So which is a, a huge but it was, uh, amount, but it was never a focus. So we always um, didn't focus on it. So for Legato, we took one of those demonstrators which, which uh, has integrated the most features, um, which is the smart mirror, because you have a gesture recognition, a face recognition, a object detection, and so on, and speech recognition. Um, so it was a good use case for, for Legato. And what is a smart mirror? I don't know if everybody knows it. Here's an example uh, for one of, uh, of one of our demonstrators. So basically, it is a semi-transparent mirror with a display behind it. So you see yourself like a normal mirror, but uh, through the display, we can um, show different kinds of information to the user. And because we know which user is in front of it, it those can be personalized. Like um, every time I'm in front of the, the mirror, it shows me the cafeteria, uh, cafeteria offering or the, the public transportation schedule, how I can get home. And we always want to, to, to um, be able to control it. So we have gesture and, voice, uh, gesture and voice recognition for it. So one of the main goals within Legato was the um, increasing the energy efficiency of our uh, use case or the demonstrator. In this um, regards, we, we tackle like 10x more energy efficiency. And we have the... Um, smart mirror as a, a, a demonstrator for this. And um, as a goal, we, we set like uh, 10 FPS would be nice because you don't need more for, for a smart mirror, but it should be uh, around 50 watt. So a lot less than uh, before. So 
First of all, to have a baseline and a starting point, we, we built uh, two different prototypes, which has the, the, the biggest uh, and baddest, uh, best uh, hardware you can think of, just to, to see w where we are starting from. So, um, on the left, you can see the, the uh, general um, modules which are running within these, uh, uh, this smart mirror which is basically object and gesture recognition and uh, face recognition and speech recognition and so on. And those are all running in parallel. And as the base uh, application, we use the Magic Mirror project, which is open, so which is open source. So yeah, um, we don't have to, to build up all modules by ourselves, but we can also integrate uh, different kinds of uh, formation um, application which are publicly available which is also nice. So in, in regards of how many neural networks we built into this uh, demonstrator, here are, are some names for it. Um, these are not all we are using, but you can already see those are a lot. So for face recognition, we have two different kinds of neural networks and SVM, uh, SVM classificator. Um, so, for object and gesture, we are using YOLO with the Darknet framework. Uh, and we are also um, getting our own data set of hand gestures for this and training ourselves. Um, yeah, and the deep speech for, for speech recognition and so on and so on. And we are also now trying to collect user behavior data um, of, the, of the different users which are using the smart mirror which is currently not so easy because of uh, our situa situation. The mirrors here in our office, in, in our building, and yeah, as you might know, uh, Corona. So we don't have that much data yet, but we are planning to, to gather, gather more and trying to, to um, train DNN for behavior prediction on this. What you can also uh, just see here is uh, we are uh, heavily using YOLO. So as one starting point for this project, we, we looked at YOLO at an early stage um, on, on different GPUs, how fast and how efficient is it running and what kind of hardware uh, are we aiming at. So we started with a, with a um, 1080 Ti, as mentioned. Um, uh, on the camera, we have a maximum of 30 FPS because we are using an Intel ReSense, which just gives us 30, 30 FPS. If you're running on, on a video, you can get much higher uh, FPS numbers, so that's why there are two of them. Um, but you can see, as soon as we introduced um, specialized cores within the 2070, we get a huge benefit of um, energy efficiency. Um, so we thought, what kind of hardware can we also use to, to, to um, use those cores, which uh, uh, turns out to be the um, NVIDIA Xavier modules. Um, which are above or uh, below our 50 watt line, uh, which we want to spend uh, a maximum for, for um, wattage. And they're faster than, than the 10 FPS we wanted to have. And um, you can put it into different modes. So this is also nice. Then we can combine maybe multiple of those to get uh, our mirror running at our desired uh, power level and performance. So then there was the idea born to, to um, basically uh, distribute every part of our um, smart mirror onto different modules, which are specialized in, in some sort of uh, computation, like the NVIDIA for some um, neural networks, or I don't know, an FPGA for, Im for, for image um, calculating and, and scaling and so on. Yeah, and some different ARM core stuff for general compute, uh, computation. So before we couldn't um, interconnect those to, to get the benefit of, out of multiple uh, microservers, so our group is also developing hardware where we can combine those uh, microservers, which is uh, seen here um, for the Edge server, which is currently under development. And the idea is that we have different kind of um, communication infrastructure um, that those modules can communicate 
And we are developing this within the COMHPC um, uh, COM uh, start standard that we can use um, modules from different vendors and place them onto our um, server and they can inter communicate and interact with each other. Yeah. So the idea is to bring the mirror onto an edge server with multiple microservers. Um, because this is ongoing work, we built ourselves a test bed before. And we started with one um, NVIDIA Xavier module and wanted to see how far, far we can get. And one is not enough to run the whole mirror, which was to be expected. We got about uh, six or five FPS in each um, detection running at the same time. And it consumed about 42 watt. Um, so it was a bit uh, too much for it. Then there was the idea born to, to couple two of those modules um, and using the, the uh, Legato tools to um, offload a part of the computation onto a, a second module, which you can see here. So basically we have two NVIDIA Xavier modules interconnected. We have PCI and they're building a, a virtual Ethernet. And now we have two which can work together. Um, so we uh, optimized uh, the, gest uh, the gesture and the object detection with the help of uh, BSC with OMS at cluster to, to run on the second Xavier. Um, so basically you write uh, OMS programmers and uh, OMS handles the uh, co communication and everything between those two modules. Um, and you can see on the on the right base, uh, basic structure how it's uh, working. And each of those uh, those um, steps are running parallel, so that the uh, communication and everything is is hidden uh, within the execution time of of YOLO, which is quite big. Um, and we managed to get um, the same uh, performance on the second. Run, uh, then running on, on the first module. So we have no loss in, 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 uh, in, in performance. But of course, we have a little bit more um, CPU usage. But the um, GPU, GPU of the first module is, is freed up so that everything can run. So we managed uh, thereby to, to get a, a FPS in, in each of the uh, in, in, in all of those uh, recognitions running simultaneously of 16 FPS, and the two Xavier combined are using 55 watts because of the um, power mode we can set, um, and that that was basically the maximum we could uh, achieve so far. But we are aiming to get this even higher, so. Um, just to, for recap, our, our performance goal was 10 FPS, which we ex, uh, achieved. Uh, but we overshoot the budget of the wattage a little bit. But this can be, uh, I guess, uh, it even better than this uh, at a later stage. Um, yes, uh, I'm all, 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 almost finished. Um, yes. So we did first uh, optimizations and get the performance up. The introduction of tensor cores uh, and the second optimization get, get us even higher. Um, but uh, we also see that the wattage consumption was, was uh, greatly reduced. And if we combine those two graphs into how much watch we spend for each FPS, we see that we already uh, are better than what we wanted. Um, just slightly, but we are. Uh, yeah. This is just a summary. So heterogeneous hardware is uh, a good approach for it. We want to combine them with the flexible high-speed low-latency communication. We have PCI Express, which will be on our hardware uh, on our edge server, and we're using uh, OMSAC cluster for distribution, and we get a, a significantly uh, energy improvement uh, up to 12x on our demonstrator. That was basically all. Thank you, thank you, Niels. So, thank you for this deep.
smart home inside. I hope I have soon a smart home. <laughs> and now we're going to Hans. Hi, Hans. Nice to Hi. see you. Good, and we hear you. Perfect. So I shortly introduce you, and meanwhile, I also give you already the moderator role. So we are a little bit moving on. Hans is CEO and co-founder of MBDL. I hope I say it right. He received his master degree in complex adaptive systems in 2012 from Sharma's University of Technology and holds double bachelor degrees, engineering physics and industrial and financial management. And Hans has, through his career in industry and academy, worked with R&D in the field of machine learning and deep learning on a range of challenging problems. Hans will introduce the energy problem in deep learning, both in learning and interference. So I let you talk because you can do it better than me. Great that you're here. And we see your presentation. It's perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much for that introduction. So my name is Hans. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Embedel. Embedel is a spin-out from the Legata project, uh, and that is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So there's three enablers for the current AI boom that we see today. We have much more data and also annotated data that we can learn these systems from, and much more compute power, and there's a lot of improvements in machine learning algorithms. There is hundreds of uh sorry that was mm, can you uh, yes sorry uh can you see the whole of my presentation because i have some uh, go to webinar that i cannot remove in front of it yes i just continue uh okay and we have applications in all industries so um that is all sunshine so what, what's the problem then as you can see in this graph uh, from OpenAI is that these models, you have the time axis uh, on X and you have the, uh, the operations that require to train these models, the dots in the graph. And on the Y axis, you actually have exponential uh, or log scale. So this uh, computation that is required to train these models actually grows exponentially. And this is a problem. It's especially a problem when you go to embedded systems. Uh, here you see a Google Net. Uh, that was a dot on the last, last graph. Uh, that contains 11 million parameters and it carries out over uh, 2 billion floating point operations to predict one frame. This is a lot of computations and it leads to systems that have difficulties in re meeting real time requirements. And all these operations uses energy. So especially for battery powered devices, this is a critical issue. And also for consumables, uh, this is a great issue because this hardware uh, is quite expensive. So it limits the innovations that a company can do uh, using advanced AI. So sure, uh, surely the research community must have done something about this and, and found solutions. And Yes, um, partly so, and uh, there's a lot of research in how to make deep learning more efficient. Uh, but this meta study from 2020 is what we found out in the beginning of the Legata project as well, that there's really no one comparing with other methods. So on the, you see here on the y-axis is the frequency of number of papers that uh, compare to these many others. So that's, there is uh, 21 papers that don't compare to any other method. And there's 22 that compared with just one. Uh, so out of these 81 papers, there's actually more than half uh, that compare with zero or one method. And this is pruning is just one method of many different approaches of optimizing deep learning. Um, so we realized that this is, this is an issue um, and we wanted to do something about this. So, um, as we, you can see in the beginning, machine learning is a fast growing field, it's a lot of research, uh, but this uh, field of optimizing these models is orthogonal to the actual model development itself. Um, and there's a need for systematic evaluation of these models. And also there's a need for combining and unify these methods. So we thought, well, this is a good opportunity to actually to make a spin out of this. So we created Embeddle which stands for Embedded Deep Learning. 
that has uh, as a mission to do efficient deep learning and automotive and IoT. So we were spin up then for Chalmers University and the Legato pro project based in Gothenburg. We are now backed by private funding and also research bodies from EU and Tetramax. And we are part of various networks, both international, European and national in Sweden. Uh, the challenges that we have set out to meet are to meet real-time requirements, reduce the, uh, the expensive hardware, reduce the cost of hardware, reduce the development process as well to reduce the time and shorten the time to market, uh, and work as a, as a partner for optimizing uh, models then for companies. So we're interacting with the tools that people use today when they develop deep learning models, more specifically TensorFlow and PyTorch. And the customer gave us requirements in terms of uh, execution time, throughput, memory limit, etc. And we, we would then optimize these uh, models to uh, meet these requirements in an automated way. And then we have um, interfaces to various hardware backends, CPU, GPU, FBA, and ASICs. Uh, and this is very much thanks to the Legato project that we can add then support for this uh, hardware backends because our background is in the machine learning and algorithms and not on the hardware side. So what kind of um, uh, performance can we actually uh, get uh, with using our tool chain? So here are some benchmarks on three different models, ResNet 18, VGG 16 and YOLO version 3 on uh, different hardware. The first one is, is uh, Intel Core, which is a, more of a desktop uh, CPU, but the other ones are intended for uh, embedded systems. And we can see that uh, the optimization uh, depends on the model and also depends on the hardware. Uh, so it's very difficult for us to say how much can you, uh, can you optimize because it's very dependent on the model and the hardware and the problem itself. Um, but we can see uh, in this graph that we typically can reach something between uh, two and uh, and and eleven times uh, more energy efficient, which is which is quite good. Um, and the same is with execution time as well. Uh, same here that we can do quite some improvement in execution time by optimizing the model. Um, See if I can show a little bit of a demo here. Um, so this is uh, me and Henrik uh, walking around the office. The, the one above is optimized and the below is not optimized. Now you will see me doing some jumping in the office and you can see that for safety critical applications for example it can be quite interesting to have high frame weight obviously because of the safety that it follows the object quite much better. So this is on the same hardware. So to summarize, Embeddle is a spun out um, from the Legato and, and Shams University and our mission is to make deep learning efficient in automotive and IoT. And our optimization approach bridges the deep learning software tools and hardware platforms. And by using our in Embeddle, uh, you can reduce en energy consumption, hardware cost, pre up time of internal resources to focus on the core problem, and you can reach faster time to market with products. That's, that's the purpose of what we are doing. And we're always looking for partners, both industry and academic partners for, uh, uh, for collaboration. So please reach out if, this, if you find this to be interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you also all the other speakers. Thank you very much. This was basically so much <laughs> that, you, <laughs> that our participants are <laughs> you don't, you don't come after with the questions so anybody was still a question please write it down but i'm the first <laughs> so directly to hans as you're still in in the picture um uh, uh, you are basically an sme uh, spin-off who is now doing ai do you already have customers i don't hear you sorry no this mute thing um yes so we have customer um yes in and it's official so we can say it's uh, it's the uh, subsidiary of volvo cars uh, senuity or now they rebranded to sensect uh, so they are customer of us and we've done uh, uh, verified the technology with pilots and now they are on a license a proper license thank you 
Yeah. Yes, say, say again more. <laughs> I didn't want to stop you. Um, and we are now looking for more customers. So we're talking and we talk with uh, customers both in Europe, Europe and um, also uh, in, in the States. Great. So now comes, uh, I will uh, give you, North Shore and Naran, I will give you now the, um, the, you can ask a question. So let's try. I give you the, yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I think Baba, I really appreciate all the individual initiatives on optimizing the energy efficiency. But my question is a little larger uh, uh, canvas and a higher level. Uh, and I think this has been actually pinching me for the last couple of years since uh, you know AI became really popular. So we talk about sustainability, we talk about energy efficiency along with AI. Are we are we not creating paradox? So uh, you know because uh, AI itself by its uh, default nature and by its DNA, it is compute intensive, energy intensive, resource intensive. So I uh, I think uh, I do not see any initiative. I've also been attending AI and sustainability tracks and webinars. Uh, we do not find any discussion happening. How do we optimize the AI itself? So do we really need to go whole hog for using too much of intelligence? Uh, you know, everywhere each use case, everywhere go deep learning, go uh, this thing. Uh, so uh, is there any initiative, any discussion happening on any platform? Uh, you know, where we can talk at the macro level that do we really need this much of artificial intelligence in every, every individual use case that we start picking? Everybody is today gung ho about AI. This is my question. Where it's a larger problem, I know, uh, but uh, not uh, commenting on the uh, importance of the current work. And I think I, these are very, very critical initiatives. Today I heard I was really excited with the kind of work because I'm a deep, I'm a hands on design engineer. But uh, the question is really larger. AI, yeah. As time is passing, we need a clear question. So can you well, just question is: uh, Is there any initiative to address the uh, optimization of AI uh, or you know a sensible, appropriate AI uh, for uh, different use cases, rather than going whole hog using maximum intelligence and uh, uh, consuming a lot of resources and making it less sustainable and less uh, energy efficient? Okay, let's try. Is somebody? of the speaker, Hans, Niels, anybody feels like answering this? No problem, no problem. No. <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> I, I understand. The question okay. is too difficult. So we are uh, passing okay. on. I'm giving now to Ahmed. I'm gonna ask the question, one moment. One moment, I have to hear. Here, uh, Ahmed Seboshi. Hello, do you have any information regarding IoT cloud energy efficient service composition selection? One moment, my speakers. Are you still there, my speakers? One moment. I give you all the mic. Anybody, Niels, Osman, Pira, Hans, do you have a sorry. Uh, Yes, sorry, I, I I could answer the first question. Uh, I, I somehow got muted. Uh, so sustainability, uh, I think this is, this is important. Um, I, uh, sustainability of, uh, let's say, AI. Um, I have not seen, uh, at least uh, on the European uh, project space, uh, I don't see uh, specifically uh, a, a project devoted to that important topic, uh, and it's uh, sort of like J1's uh, paradox, right? We we get a lot of energy savings, and then we start we say, ah, oh, we since we have lots of energy savings, let's throw some more, uh, let's say, uh, computing power at it. Let's add some more uh, layers, etc. And then in the end, we we end up uh, uh, spending the same amount of energy. So I think uh, <laughs> yes, yes, that is my point exactly. Yeah, thank you. So we have to tackle that. Uh, I I think uh, yeah. if there's anyone from the European Commission uh, listening to this talk, I think it would be really sorely needed. <laughs> in personal yeah, we, opinion. Yeah, we need to start discussion on this topic also. How do we talk about appropriate or reasonable amount of artificial intelligence in any use case, rather than going full hog based on our requirement? 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Osman. Thank you, Mr. Kishore. <laughs> and now, once more, back to the question we just had. Hello. Do you have any any information regarding IoT cloud energy efficient service composition selection? It's from Ahmed Sibushi. So what is meant with uh, uh, composition selection? Is that uh, choosing choosing um, to do the competition on edge or on cloud or a combination of those? Or I will now let him talk as we are we are over time. So anybody who feels like staying in the cafe, welcome, because we have so many speakers, so it goes longer. But um, I now will let Ahmed speak. One moment. Ahmed, one moment, you're coming. I think he, he left. He's not there anymore. So we cannot answer. So I'm going to the next question. Anne Flint, could you give a quick comment on what the difference of this platform is to Google's Colab? Was that to me? The, yes. Okay. Um, so Colab, I have not used Colab myself, uh, but it's something similar to uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook, right? You have a notebook and you do uh, various code blocks and you execute them, or is it more like Amazon's um, tools that they have for deploying uh, uh, deep learning into IoT? The problem here is that we cannot, like, let's try that. Anna wants to talk. The counter questions don't work well here, so basically we can try to get her. Okay, okay, I can I can try to answer it, uh, but I might answer it very wrong right now. Uh, so if it's more of a you put a notebook, so I mean you can develop your deep learning model in a collab or you put with notebook or Python or whatever you want using your favorite tools uh, like uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and uh, and then Bedel is a Python library in itself that you would import as any other Python library and optimize the model uh, and generate an uh, optimized model for a particular target. So this can obviously be uh, put behind a cloud service and then we would have something similar to what Amazon is doing. And that's something that we are considering for the future. Uh, but right now we're using it as more of a standalone, standalone Python tool where we work closely with the company as well to learn more about the specific problems that they have, uh, because it's it, it's not only this problem, there's sort of tangent uh, or closely related problem that, that needs might need some special implementations. Okay, thank you. So we are going now. Thank you. Anna says already, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so we're going to the last question because we're really over time. Um, so Peter Malik. There are many methods to improve efficiency, parameters, reduction, compression, quantization, but a lot of it depends on good low level support. Can you give a quick summary what really work at the moment, what really improve efficiency on what hardware? <laughs> this is, <laughs> I think this is not a small question. <laughs> I no, am, yes, but <laughs> give it a quick shot. And it, it, it's not a small question. It's also a bit of a sensitive one because that's that's sort of what we are packaging and sell as a black box solution. But you're absolutely right. There's a lot of things that we do internally that we're really excited about, but it does not exist any hardware support for it. So we cannot really deploy it. So we would not see the benefits. For example, when you do a, a sparse optimization so that you will have sparse neurons, sparse excitation, or especially then the weights, the sparsification of weights, then you need to have a runtime that uh, or hardware that can take benefit from that. And you can customize that in FPGA or you can do your own ASIC, but most people will not do that, but use, for example, NVIDIA GPUs. And then you need to do, for example, structured uh, uh, reduction of, 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 of parameters where you actually are sympathetic to the hardware. And that's sort of what we do, given what model you have, what, what, uh, what uh, optimization methods you do uh, according to this hardware target that you have. Um, and so it becomes a, a combinatorial problem so, of, of doing this, um, and that, that's that's basically what we do in the company. Thank you. 
So I think we're really over time. So it's uh, thank you for everybody being here. Thank you. And um, it's always challenging when we have a lot of speakers and uh, there are many more questions out there. So if you want to ask more questions, dear participants, uh, send it to me, Carmen at Grassroots Arts. You will get tomorrow latest <laughs> another email from me. And then I forward it. Please say to whom you have a question and I will forward it either to Osman or to Pira or to Hans or to Niels. And so once more, thank you for you all being here. It was a pleasure to host you. And um, I got already a lot of great uh, congratulations for this um, cafe because it's an interesting theme. It's, people love it. And um, so I will send you afterwards the recording uh, and you may allow me to publish it in the AI for you channels on YouTube. Please send me back an OK or, or red light. No, <laughs> it's OK. And thank you very much and hope to see you one day in the real world. Bye bye. Bye bye. And next week is a new cafe on Tuesday, but you get invitations. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.